Okay, well, good morning, everyone. You can go ahead and open up to Matthew 24 for our jumping off uh, spot as we continue to move through our eschatology study. We spent a couple weeks in the Alva Discourse going through uh, what certainly I and, and uh, you've heard Pastor Brian in Sunday School say as well that we believe that this is the key uh, to understanding eschatology or to understanding end time <coughs> things. This is Jesus' teaching on the end times. So we've walked through, we've built our construct, and actually if you look, I put a couple new things on there this morning because we've been talking about them so much. Uh, the Battle of Armageddon, remember we talked about this a couple weeks ago because we compared the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24. Remember, the Olivet Discourse is the discourse on the Mount of Olives that Jesus gives on that Tuesday, okay, as we're walking through it on Sunday mornings, it should all be really weighty and heavy on us as we've gone through it a lot. So two days before he goes to the cross, he gives his teaching to the disciples about the end times. So that's what we're referring to when we say that all of a discourse. Um, the abomination of desolation. Remember what that is. That is going to be in the middle of the seven-year period, the 70th week, which is still future that we're looking for, where there's going to be a temple or a tabernacle built at the beginning. There will be sacrifices going on. Uh, the Antichrist will put it into that in the temple, and he will stop all the oblations and the sacrifices that are happening, and he will say, worship me, I am God. He will set up an idol uh, in the temple and tell the people to worship him. And then after that, Jesus says there will be a time of great tribulation, okay? Until, remember, he, come, he cuts it off and cuts it short for the elect's sake. Well, how does he do that? He does that at his second coming. So what we have put in here is, and, and if you remember... which is the classic rapture passage that Paul gives us uh, about those who are dead will rise first and those who are alive and remain will be taken up after that. And remember it says in the clouds and there's a trumpet and Christ comes and gathers his elect. Sounds a lot like what he says in Matthew 24. Does not sound a lot like the battle of Armageddon that we, we hear of when we go to Revelation 20. So we compared those three scriptures and come to the conclusion that Jesus' teaching looks like it's in line with what Paul is talking about not what John is talking about at the end of the, the time frame. So our question was, remember, is Jesus talking about... And is it the same talk that, that Paul is talking about, and that Peter is talking about, and that John is talking about, and, and the other... Or is Paul talking about a secret, different uh, gathering, a different rapture or resurrection, if you will, than Jesus is, and it's a secret one, and no one else had revelation of that except for Paul, um, and that's very dangerous, okay? So we don't believe that that's the case. We believe they're all talking about this. What is D-O-L? Anyone know what's that stand for? Day of the Lord. Good, yeah. Day of the Lord. Okay, we have the sun, moon, and stars will be darkened, as Jesus tells us. After the abomination, he says, the sun and moon and stars will fail to get their light. Then look for the sign of the Son of Man coming in the clouds with clouds, right? Trumpets, angels gathering together the elect. What does that sound like? The first resurrection. Sounds like what Paul's talking about, 1 Thessalonians 4. So I've put it up at the beginning here, and you'll see why later as we're going to continue to unpack things. Remember, we don't know when that's going to happen. We believe it's going to happen from the midpoint before the end somewhere in here, okay, is where the second coming of Christ is going to happen. So I put that on there. I put the Battle of Armageddon on there at the end, which is uh, the culmination of God's wrath in that seven-year period at the end, okay? So I apologize. I know uh, you're coming into this, boom, fresh Carmen as well. You have been around for a while. So we're deep into it. We are in the deep end of the pool stuff with end time stuff for sure. Um, but we're going to keep moving through. And if you have questions, we can certainly talk about those uh, more later. So we went through all of the discourse a lot, uh, a couple weeks here, but a lot in preaching through it in five weeks in service in Mark 13. Last week, we got into the end of the age, and I'll just put this up as a reminder. Remember the parables in Matthew 13. We looked through the parable of the wheat and the tares. Remember the wheat and the tares, and it, he tells us exactly. He gives us the key to the parable. He says, here's what the parable means. Remember, the end, it's the end of the age. The harvest is the end of the age. You have the children of the, the, the good seed, and you have the children of the wicked seed, and the wheat and the tares, and the, remember, they let them grow up together until the time of the harvest. And then, what does he say? Bundle up, separate them, bundle up the tares to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. And he says, that's what it'll look like at the end of the age. He then gives a parable, we talked about the one with the net, and how they cast the net, they bring all the fish into the boat, and they keep the good fish in the boat, what do they do with all the other fish? 
throw them back. They throw them back. And he says where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth, that's what it's going to look like. So we're continuing to unpack this thought of the end of the age. Okay? Um, quick thoughts or questions on, on that type of part of the review before we uh, keep moving? Or any comments or anything that I missed that maybe we should clarify? A lot of writing, yes. Um, this, is, this is the Baptist point of view, right? No. Uh, so there'll be tons of different point of views, That's even in the Baptist, right? even in Baptist. This is our point of view. This is what the three pastors here believe that the Bible says. Um, so yes, so Carmen, there are, there are a number of different views and understandings of the end times. And so we are unpacking what we believe the Bible says to, to us. Good question. And with that being said, I want to clarify again for us that your beliefs and your thoughts on wherever you are and whatever camp you fall in in this has nothing to do with your salvation, right? We're saved by one way and only one way, by the grace of God, by the mercy that he's shown uh, in, in calling us to salvation, that we have been saved by faith, right? It's uh, by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. That's how you're saved. That's it. So there are certainly believers and brothers and sisters who are saved that are on different camps than we are. And so that's okay. And, and I would say that's okay to a certain degree. There are, there are camps that I think are so out of bounds that I don't think it would be good, you know, for us to fellowship together. Or, you know, I don't think they'd be comfortable in our church. And I certainly would be comfortable in a, in a church of certain views, like the preterist view, um, for instance, is the one that says it's all happened already, that there is no future fulfillment, um, that it's all spiritualized. There's, there's just some different camps that I think are too out there that, uh, that, that I wouldn't want to say are acceptable. Okay? But certainly, with that being said, we believe that the scriptures point us to understand the majority of this stuff, that we can understand it. Okay? So, end of the age. Remember, here's the key. The end of the age happens when? When does the end of the age happen? The rapture. Good. He says it, right? He says, uh, remember, that's the questions he's <coughs> answering in the beginning of chapter 24 of Matthew. They say, what are the signs of your coming and of the end of the age? Meaning it happens together. They understood that it all happens together, just like Sam said. Day of the Lord happens when Christ comes. That's the end of this time. That's the end of this age or the end of this era. And then we'll start a new age and a new era that, that Christ will usher in. Because what happens after that? After he comes, what is he coming to do? Pour out wrath upon the ungodly, save the righteous, and then what's he going to set up? It's true. Yeah. Right. 1,000 year millennial <laughs> kingdom reign. Okay? So it's going to be a total different time. Christ is going to be ruling and be reigning on the earth from a throne in Jerusalem. Okay? That's going to be totally different. Totally different time frame. So this age ends at Christ's coming. And we see that in the scriptures that we've been looking at so far last week, two things happen simultaneously at the end of the age. When Jesus comes and the end of the age happens, there will be a separation. That's what the harvest is all about. That's what the net parable is all about. That's what all the parables in Matthew 13 are all about and other places we're going to go to. That simultaneously, he separates the righteous from the wicked and he gathers the righteous to himself, right? Gather the wheat into my barn. And then he, got, he uh, takes the rest of them and, and they are punished. So the rest of the wicked, which the rest of the people all left behind are who? Only the wicked right? He gathers together his people. All the righteous will be taken in the first resurrection. If you believe pre-trib, post-trib, uh, mid-trib, amil, pre-mil, blah, 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 it doesn't matter. If you're a believer and you're saved by faith in Christ like we just talked about, when he comes, you're going, <laughs> okay? He's not going to be like, well, you thought it was, you know, post-trib, so I'll leave here, you here till post-trib. Uh, and for the pre-tribbers, I'll take you on pre-trib, right? That's not how it works. God is the one setting the time frame and doing what he's going to do. And so uh, have no fear. That's what Paul was writing to the church at Thessalonica about. Remember, take uh, courage and, and encourage and strengthen each other with these words that your loved ones haven't missed it. Every believer is going to be there. You're not going to miss this thing, okay? Uh, that's the point of, of Jesus saying that uh, all that the Father has given to me, I lose none of them, John 10, okay? No man can pluck them out of my hand. If you're saved, you're saved. You're not going to miss this day, dead or alive. It doesn't matter. You're going to be there, okay? You're on the right team, right? If you're the elect, you're on the winning team. Amen? You understand that? We're victorious. We're already victorious. This book's over. It's already been written, and we win because we're on Christ's side, 
Okay. So, um, so as we, yes, sir, do you have a question? Just, I don't know, the one thing I don't remember is like that time period, like after the rapture and before the millennium, millennium. Like it's like a, it's kind of, it's a battle or? At the end there will be. So we're going to get there when we but get to Revelation. What's going on between? Remember there's the trumpets and the vials that when we get in Revelation we'll talk about. The wrath of God that's poured out upon the earth and upon Before all the, the people. Before the final battle. Right. Where all that at? time is going on. It'll, it'll be in here. So once he comes here, he that's right. brings us up, which I should have wrote that. That's the first resurrection happens <clears> here, or the rapture happens here. Then he pours out uh, the wrath of God is poured out in the rest of that time, which we will find about, out about in Revelation, the, uh, the, the <coughs> trumpets and the vials of the wrath of God. And then it'll end in the, the Battle of Armageddon. It's like the last-ditch effort of people going against God, who's been pouring his wrath out upon them for you know a couple of years. And, you know, as believers, we're, we're not due wrath of God, so right. we will be removed before right. God pours out the wrath on the earth. Yep, that's right. So to that point, that's what the day of the Lord is. That's what the end of age is. Two things happen same time, same day, not seven years apart, not seven hours apart, same time, same day. We're going to get into that a little bit more today. Saving the righteous, like Adam said, because God's wrath, First Thessalonians 5, 9, and I believe Romans 5, 9 as well, talk about uh, that we are not appointed unto God's wrath. His wrath is not upon us. That's how we know also that after the abomination of desolation, when the Antichrist is slaughtering and killing Christians, that's not the wrath of God. God's wrath is not killing and beheading Christians, okay? That's the wrath of who? Satan and the Antichrist. Okay, yes ma'am? I'm a little confused. So who asked who asked what will the end times look like? What will the new you know So look at Matthew twenty four and that's at the beginning. If you look in verse um, first couple of verses, he taught them, tell Matthew us Matthew twenty four. Yep. Mm -hmm. Verse three. So the thing that I'm confused about is the disciples. Just, and at Mark yeah, we find out it's four disciples who ask him. So if they didn't really understand, like we've talked a lot about, they don't really understand what's happening, yes. that Jesus is going to die. They don't. They don't have a, any idea what's really happening. So what prompted them to ask? Because they don't understand. When is the end of times? Like they don't right. know that Jesus is going to die. Why would they ask when the That's an awesome question. Because it's segueing right into where we're going. So he's taught them this before. This isn't the first time he's taught okay. them this. Because it's like they have no clue what's going on. And, and, and then we have it recorded. So maybe he's told them 20 times already that we don't have it recorded. And, but I'm going to show you that he's told them this all this before. Um, and so we're going to look at that now. So they're asking him because he's just, pe they're piecing it together. Remember, as God allows them to piece it together it, yeah. um, for all of us, that's how it works. So mm -hmm. as God reveals things to you, he does it in his time frame. Um, he's doing the same thing with them. They don't understand these things, but they're still asking them. That's just how Because they're so clueless as to really what's happening. But it's hard to imagine that they would be even prompted to ask these questions. Well, they probably ask, in, in their mind, their question is probably not 2,000 years in the future. You yeah. know what I mean? They're That's probably right. thinking much more They're recent. still on the yeah, frame yeah, yeah. of he's the Messiah. He's come to overthrow the Roman authorities and set a kingdom up. That's what the Messiah is to do. That's what all the Old Testament believes. That's what the Bible says. Only the New Testament reveals that there was something that was going to happen first and the old testament does as well but they it was a hidden mystery remember we talked about that paul talks about in the new testament that this gospel of the salvation going to the gentiles being grafted in the the mystery of of god which is what we've got down there the mystery of god at work from the time of the cross till the the seven year period is this mystery that's been revealed to us that the old testament is all about jesus coming being born a virgin dying on the cross but to them they didn't understand that they understood the Messiah is coming, conquering and setting up the millennial kingdom. He is going to do that, right? He's going to do that way down here. They didn't understand. Take this bracket and move it right here. That's what they thought's happening. Jesus is here. The Messiah is here. It's millennial time. We're going to rule with him. Let's go. He's going to overthrow Rome, and that's what we're doing. So they they're asking, he's... hey, when's that going to happen? When's that going to happen? That's what right, they, they want to know. They think he's going to live and be king and take over yep. Rome. Yep. They don't, what would make them say... When's the whole earth going to disappear and we're going to have a new heaven and hell? Like, you know what I mean? Because Old Testament prophecies tell us that that's all going to happen at the time that the Messiah reigns. Like I said, it's all this. So after this happens, it's all going to be over. So they're thinking this is what's going to happen. But they're just, like he said, they didn't know there's going to be this huge gap yeah. in between that. They didn't understand Jesus had to die first to accomplish the plan of redemption of God before he could rule and reign and do the things he's going to do. 
Understand? Because if they knew it was going to be that long, they probably wouldn't have asked it. You know what I mean? They'd be like, it's, it doesn't even have anything to do with us. <laughs> well, the funny thing is, remember that it's God's word. It's inspired. It's perfect. Yeah. All there's, I could take you to tons of places in the Old Testament where people were talking about things they have no clue about. When we already looked at Daniel, he was clueless. Tell me what these things mean. And he said, nope, seal it up to the end. <laughs> like, what? You're not going to tell me? No, I'm not going to tell you. Like, I just wanted you to ask it so it could be written in here so, so that we could read it and teach it 2,000 years later. Yeah. It's also yeah. time to human timing and God's timing are two different forms yeah. of time. Yep. So we have to, we always put it on our perspective. Like, mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah, because the God. one thing. But this is the key of where your question is because they're asking these questions because they already understood. Why would they ask? Well, because he's telling them about the destruction of the temple. Well, when's the temple going to be destroyed? Science of that and of the end of the age. They understand all that to happen together. That's what that's what I'm saying. They knew that he taught all that happens at the same time. And we're gonna look at that today. Good? Sorry. No, the one thing <clears throat> that's always kind of you can go ahead and doesn't look matter because it's just how God decided to do it. But that's right. The fact that he comes in the rapture and then takes that long to destroy you know, you think God could just come down and be like, Bam, you're that's done. That's right. We could do all this in one day. <laughs> But he decides to stretch it out. Exactly you know right. I mean? so and the funny thing it's is... It's always that, seemed weird to me, but uh, obviously I'm not God either. That's right. And we don't understand that concept because of what you just said. It could happen in all one day. And you know what the Bible says? The Bible says it does all happen in one day. It's called the day of the Lord. And that day is doesn't refer to a four-hour day like we're talking about. That's why it's a different time and a different age. It's a totally different he time. says, like yeah. in First Peter, that a thousand day a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day because God's timing again is perfect, yeah. and He mm-hmm. looks at it differently. But Paul, we've already looked at Paul talking about the gathering together of the elect in First Thessalonians four uh, and, and Second Thessalonians two and, and uh, First Thessalonians chapter four and five. Excuse me, that the gathering together of the elect, he says, is the day of the Lord. You have no need that I tell you what the day of the Lord is. It comes as a thief in the night, right? But not as a thief to you guys, because you're chilling in the day, not chilling in the night, so that that day should fall upon you as a thief. So you will know and understand as a believer. The non-believers won't understand, nor will ignorant believers, right? You with me? There'll be plenty of believers that don't get it and don't understand. Okay, so um, the point is, Paul says that's the day of the Lord. When Jesus comes in the rapture is the day of the Lord. Well, Peter says later, that the burning of the heavens and the earth also happens on the day of the Lord. Well, that happens way down here after the Millennium Kingdom. So over a thousand years, let's just say for easy sake that he comes and there's three years left in this period. Are you with me? So mm-hmm. so six months after the, the abomination desolation happens when? After Midpoint, right? Mm-hmm. Three and a half years. So let's say six months later is when he comes. You've got three years to finish the seven years, right? Then you have a thousand years in the millennial kingdom. So you've got a thousand and three years where at the beginning of it, Paul says it's the day of the Lord. At the end of it, Peter says it's the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord lasts for over a thousand years. T- to your point, it does all happen in one day. Just it's not almost, our kind of day. It's yeah. almost like it's <laughs> almost like what he did. They both say it's the day of the Lord. It's over a thousand year difference that they're talking about. They're not talking about two different day of the Lords. They're talking about the same day of the Lord. I mean, it's it's almost like a little bit like what he did with parables, where he speaking to two groups of people, and you know what I mean? Because like as a believer, if you study this, you can make sense of that. And, it, and he, it's not like he was. I don't know that I can. Even as I'm well, saying that, it sounds crazy. It doesn't. But you understand you what I mean? Think about it like an age. It, it does make sense, but it's just not. It's almost like a double meaning, almost. Right. Know? But obviously, it's so many things that he's fulfilling, and you think back to like the beginning in Genesis, and just in the beginning of time, how he starts talking about what's going to happen. And yeah. you know what I mean? Like he's setting the stage for all these things that are going to happen. We just, we just can't see the. Funny picture. thing is, she just prompted. So we're going go back to Genesis. Flip all the way back to Genesis. Look, look at creation events, and I got to find out where I want to go. Okay, verse fourteen. On what? Genesis, uh, Genesis what? chapter one. We're like, what? Where? Genesis chapter 1, all the way back to the beginning. Understand, listen, what are the signs of the day of the Lord? What's going to happen right before the day of the Lord? The sun, moon, and stars. Sun, moon, and stars are going to be darkened. We would call that celestial signs is what I would call that. Okay? Look at verse 14 of chapter 1 of Genesis. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. What are we talking about? Creating day and nighttime. Mm-hmm. Right? That's the very beginning. 
and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. So let them be for days and years and keeping track of your time for you to make it easy because God understands time. What's the first thing it says? Let them be for signs. Well, guess what? The biggest signs that they're going to be made for is for the day of the Lord. Okay? He tells you right there in the beginning that's, that's one of the reasons they're even created is to give you signs for the coming day of the Lord. Well, and if all so, of the sun, well, I guess. Pretty crazy. If the sun, moon, and stars, it would just be one day. <laughs> it would just be one long day if there's, <laughs> maybe there's right, not going to be didn't night. Change them. So yeah, maybe yeah. it really will be one day. Like, there's not going to be night anymore. A lot of, that's you know a whole I mean? other big topic of conversation. That will certainly be true in the new heaven and new earth. It says that there is no light. Jesus is the light. And there is no darkness or no more night. Uh-huh. And that's in the new heaven and new earth. I mean, it's definitely so, a thought that. You know, maybe when he comes back, the rapture, that's the end of that's the end of day and night, day and night. You know, maybe it is just one long day. day at that point. Yeah. We'll see. Maybe that's why he words it we like that. We shall see. <laughs> <laughs> so go to Luke 17, uh, if you're not there yet. So we're going to look at this because we've looked at Jesus' teachings. We look at Peter. We look at Paul. We look at many of them. Let's look at what we've got here in the Gospel, <clears throat> 17, uh, verse 26. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage. Until the day when Noah entered the ark, the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, just was as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But on the day when Lot went out from Sodom, fire and sulfur or fire and brimstone rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. So will it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Well, what's the day that the Son of Man is revealed? He's coming from lightning flashes from the east to the west. No one's going to miss it. Why are the Son of Man's stars going to be darkened? To make this place a darkness place. So when he comes, he's going to light up like the 4th of July, you guys. The place is going to be lit up like crazy. No one's going to miss it. It's no secret. It's not a mystery. He's going to come and light up the sky and light up the world. It's going to be a creation-changing event. It's going to be unbelievable. Well, that's the day he's going to reveal himself when he comes. That's what he's talking about here. Sounds familiar, right? Because what does Jesus say in Matthew 24? Just as the days of, of, of Noah, that they were eating and drinking and marrying. Same exact thing. This is what he taught them. Now, Luke 17 happens before Matthew 24. He's already taught them about the days of Noah and the days of Lot, which is why they understand the end of the age happens when Jesus comes, because that's what he's told them, okay? Same event, same time. And this was taught, again, before the, all the discourse. Matthew 13, the parable we talked about, of the wheat and the tares, separating in the harvest at the end of the age, all that, before the all the discourse. <coughs> so there's two big instances with Matthew 13 and Luke 17 that we can look at right now and see Jesus taught them and told them about this prior to the all the discourse. Are you with me? Mm-hmm. So that goes back to what you're saying. They already know. They already heard this. And those are the two that we have recorded. There certainly, I'm sure, was many other conversations of, of, of uh, this discussion, you know, that was this had around dinner table or wherever it was, uh, that remember John 20, John 21 tells us all the things that happened couldn't be written or else the world can yeah. contain the books mm-hmm. of what happened in Jesus' ministry. Okay, so you can, you can bet their conversations were more than double that amount of books, you know? Mm-hmm. Okay. Good. Hey, hey, good morning, brother. Come on in. So that was taught before the all the discourse. Now, flip back to Second Peter chapter two. Come on in, brother, grab a seat. Second Peter chapter two. So let's hit Peter up now, because who have we looked at? We see Jesus teaching in Matthew 13, Jesus teaching Luke 17, Jesus teaching Matthew 24 and Mark 13 and Luke 21. We have seen John talk about it in Revelation chapter 6 and Revelation chapter 14. And we've seen Paul talk about it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 5 and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Right? So we've got Jesus, Paul, um, let's look at Peter. 2 Peter chapter 2. Verse 4 says, For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of, of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of ungodly, 
if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction. So what are the two examples he's given here? Noah and Lot. See it? The days of Noah, the days of Lot. Making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued Lot great, from great distress by the sensual con conduct of the wicked, for as the righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul after the lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Then, here's the key. Look at verse 9. The Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials. Or that actually means the, the intent of the original language there means out of. So it doesn't mean what the preacher at camp would say that, yeah, God does know how to save the godly from it. He takes them out of the way and raptures us before that happens. No, it means out of the midst of is what the intent of the language is. It means God is certainly capable of not teleporting you off the planet, but protecting you through the rest of it, right? Did he teleport Noah off? No, he put him in a boat with seven other people and saved them. Did he teleport Lot off? Nope, he just took him out of the city before he crushed it. Did he, did he take Rahab out of the city before she, he destroyed the walls? Nope. He just protected her and her family in that one little house, and everything else was destroyed. God is God, you guys. Mm -hmm. He's certainly able to protect you in any situation. And he's certainly capable of protecting <clears throat> his church and his faithful and his beloved and his elect during a time of great distress and great tribulation. Right? Mm -hmm. Certainly. And that's what Peter says. Okay? So from the midst of this, and I just talked about a couple of those, but I just put a couple examples. You talked about Egypt, bro, right? At, at the beginning, when we were having prayer time, you were talking about Israel when they were in Egypt. Um, same thing, right? He was able to, to put the plagues on Egypt. Did any of the ten plagues touch the children of Israel? Not one. Not one of their cows were killed. Not one of their firstborn were killed. They had lights when they had lights all in their area. When the rest of Egypt didn't have lights, there were no lights, there were no frogs. Nothing was touching the children of Israel. That's impossible. No, it's God. With God, all things are, impossible, are possible. The, the frogs and the lights and the light and the cows and all that were told, you don't cross this line. And guess what? They don't. Right? That's God. That, that's what we're talking about. Uh, Hananiah, Azariah, Michelle, those are, uh, sorry, that's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, in the fire furnace. He put them in the fire furnace. They knew that they were going in, and they knew their God could save them, but they also knew what? They could die. And they were willing to die. But what did he do? He didn't put the fire out. He put them in the fire, and he was with them in the fire and protected them and brought them out. Okay? That's always, again, the scene we see all throughout scriptures is that you will be protected through tribulation. Not that you're going to be taken out before the tribulation. That in this life you will have tri tribulation and trials, John 16, 33. But be of good cheer because I've overcome the world. God is capable, knows how to rescue the godly out of the trials and out of the tribulations. You may go through the tribulation. Many of us and all of us probably have gone through some tribulation in your life, and you've come out the other side. You'll either come out the other side, and, and it'll be to God's glory. And I think I even preached about this last week. It's just come refresh in my mind. Um, but the point is, you may get through the trial, and you, God's with you through it. And so it may be that you get through the trial, and, and something great happens for you or to someone else. And I don't mean in a worldly way. You know what I'm saying. Um, but it may be that your trial in that tribulation ends in death. And glory be to God, because to live is Christ and to die is gain. This is not our home. This is not what it's all about. You look to the joy on the other side of the tribulation and the other side of whatever's happening. And that may be him taking you home and being in his presence and being glorified right then and there. It's an idea, too, like, you know, depending on what, what you know, we probably all been taught different things when it comes to the day of the Lord. What I see, and I just share just a real personal kind of clarity, is that the scripture talks about suffering, what suffering does, and, and be That's prepared right. to be watch, watchful. I know for, you know, uh, basically to, are we, we raptured before um, tribulation or in the middle of it? And it's the idea of being prepared. Right. Um, definitely, I see the, the word talking about being in the tribulation, God cutting that time short. We're not due wrath, but it's about being prepared because what if the, the man's interpretation of a pre trip rapture is not right? And then we are sitting in the middle of tribulation saying, Why are we here? We're not supposed to be here. Yeah. So we're prepared for that so we can endure. That's right. if, and if God, and if our, if what we something else happens, wrong, yeah. if we're raptured prior, then it's a blessing. Mm -hmm. But at one point, we are to be prepared and we right. have to 
certainly prepare our children because it could be their time, it could be their children's time. So we have right. to keep that truth rolling. Right. Um, just to Amen. be prepared for. And so Adam's stepping in, and most of you know Adam, but yeah, Adam's stepping in right into it. And he went through this study with us in uh, Men's Bible Study a couple of years ago. Yeah, exactly right, because we've said that is the same thing. That You know what? Why does he keep saying be watching, keep watching, and be prepared and be ready if there's nothing to be watching for and be prepared for? Good. Well, I think, too, when you're going through trials, I think that's such a good point, because I brought that up. What is the point? Why Why is it so dangerous to be prepared? But that's and just kind of a hypothetical. Um, obviously, we should be prepared, but... Um, I think when you're going through the difficult times, like all day was saying too, it, you have to have faith. Like without faith, you wouldn't have made it through this season. You know, you, you could give into so many different things or just go down left field if you didn't have your faith in Christ. You know, you just wouldn't make it. I don't. I Certainly. would not make it. I don't know how people make Nobody it. Nobody makes it. <laughs> no. Nobody will make it. That's right. So uh, we'll start a little bit now into the day of the Lord. So we're talking about the Olive Discourse. We've come through a lot of these things. You see why now we talk about the end of the age. These are the things that are uh, the nuts and bolts. This is how we understand Jesus' is teaching. This is how we understand, is Paul talking about a different one that, or the same one that Jesus is? Look for consistency, right? Allow Scripture to interpret Scripture for us, not my thought or Adam's thought or Pastor Brian's thought or any other thought. Let's allow Scripture to inform us and give us understanding of the rest of Scriptures. So you understand and see now why understanding the end of the age, the harvest, these two things happen at the same time. Noah, Lot, the imagery, the pictures that are all given. He says, so too will it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Those are all the descriptions. Now, we've talked about that is called the day of the Lord. So now we need to unpack and talk more about the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord, I believe, this was the biggest thing for me. The day of the Lord is what really... The, all the discourse in Jesus' teaching and coming to study the day of the Lord is, is, was like silver bullet uh, to, to me. It's really where God changed my total perspective of everything. Um, this has probably been 10 years ago now uh, for me that I changed, as, as I've already told you many times, from the dispensational, the pre-trib rapture popular view to what I'm teaching now. Uh, was about 10 years ago. And so it was a big wrestling match. It's difficult, I understand. Uh, it's hard to unlearn things that we've learned. Uh, Adam and I had that discussion earlier this week, and, uh, and it is. But that's always what we want to strive to do is not listen to my teaching or any other man's teaching, but listen to the Holy Spirit, right? Uh, Paul says you have no need that any man teach you. Certainly I'm not saying that that's not what you're supposed to do. God has gifted teachers and preachers and pastors for the benefit of the church, but they're still men. Okay, so you've got to hold them accountable to Scripture, which this is the authority, not men, right? Okay, so that's what we're doing. That's what we're going to always strive to do. So the day of the Lord, uh, all through Scriptures, you'll talk, you'll hear about the day of the Lord, and many it's been eye-opening. I know Sam and I've talked about it, Jacob and I, uh, many of us who have read through the Bible in a year. I do this like every year, and so I have a group of us that, that do it on this app together, and it's crazy how when you read the Bible's entirety how much you see this stuff it's everywhere it's everywhere the day of the lord and the second coming of christ is everywhere in the bible and you can't miss it it's like some of you can talk to me about election how your view has changed on election right from oh i don't raise my hand and say this prayer but god chose me and it was his will and that's what he did and he does it and now when you read the scriptures you're like this is crazy it's talked about all over the place same thing with the day of the lord okay and with end times so it's called the last day it's called the day of Christ. It's called the day of God. It's all referring to the same day. It's all referring to what we call the day of the Lord. Now, this is the most prophesized, most talked about, most significant uh, sign or detail that has to do with the end times, I think, hands down. Um, this, this is the big, like I said, the silver bullet. And yet, no one ever talks about it. No one preaches about it. No one speaks about it, which isn't a surprise because we understand what the church today uh, in America looks like. But... A lot of people won't preach through like we're doing in the book of Mark right now. Because why? When you get to Mark 13, there's a lot of hard stuff in there. What is that talking about? They, I don't want to tackle that. I don't want to talk about that. Uh, I, most, most of them probably don't even really know about that. As A lot of people, unfortunately, don't do their due diligence of studying and being prepared and being able to prepare others. So it's really hard because it's not talked about. It's not a, it's not a feel-good thing, right? It's not health, wealth, and prosperity. Uh, it, it's not easy listening. It's hard to tolerate. It could be offensive. Um, all those things that we always talk about. Okay, but the gospel in the Bible is offensive. Okay, that's the message of the cross. So it's called the great and terrible day of the Lord. Okay, flip over to Joel, uh, back in your Old Testament. Flip over to Joel chapter 2, and we'll wrap up with this one, and we'll get some more uh, question and discussion time. Joel chapter 2. 
Isaiah, Jeremiah, where are we going? Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel. They're little ones, it's a small prophet. So if you flip like 20 pages, you could pass like four books. <laughs> Joel chapter 2. Um, I'm not sure yet. I'm going to take you there in one second. Well, I want to go, I'm going to end up in 32, but I'm going to start in 10. So, Joel talks about it. Um, we're going to go through some of these. So, I'm going to give you a lot of scriptures we're going to go through. We're just going to hit Joel 2 today. We'll start in Isaiah next week. Because Old Testament, um, I believe it's 11 of the, of the Old Testament prophets talk about the day of the Lord. Okay? So, like 11 out of 13 talk about the day of the Lord in, in their writings. Joel's is significant. Let's look at Joel chapter 2. And probably at Joel chapter 2, you guys have a heading. Anybody have a heading and a... Labeled there at the, at before, the day of the Lord. Joel chapter 2. Right, day of the Lord. Verse 10 says, The earth quakes before them. Funny enough, look at verse. Look at the end of verse 9. It says, They enter through the windows like a thief. <laughs> See that? That just stuck out to me. But look at verse 10. The earth quakes before them. The heavens tremble. The sun and the moon are darkened, and the stars withdraw their shining. The Lord utters his voice before his army. His camp is exceedingly great. He who excuses, or he, excuse me, he who executes his word is powerful. For the day of the Lord is great and very awesome, or terrible. Who can endure it? Look at verse 32. I'm going to start in verse 31. That's the one I'm looking for. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome, or great and terrible day of the Lord comes. So, look over at, actually keep going, man. I can yeah, see more. Pretty. Look at verse 14 of chapter 3. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon are darkened, and the stars withdraw their shining. See it? Joel gives it to us three times right here in this short little book, right? There's only three chapters in Joel, and we get it three times. And what does he say happens before the day of the Lord? Sun, moon, and stars are darkened. Celestial signs, back to Genesis 1 again. The signs in the sun, moon, and stars, they happen before the day of the Lord. That's huge to understand. That's vital to understand. Because if we understand that the day of the Lord is the day of Jesus' second coming, which makes sense, yes? Why is it called the day of the Lord, you guys? Because it's when the Lord comes back, okay? It's it's not that's not a hard one. The day of the Lord is the day of the Lord when G, when the Lord comes back. That's His arrival. That's His coming. So Joel says before that happens, the sun and the moon stars are darkened. Well, go back to Matthew twenty four as we close, and look at what Jesus says in verse twenty nine. The sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Didn't Joel just talk about an earthquake happens too? Yeah. Why will the earth be shaken? Because there's an earthquake. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with great power and glory, and he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call and will gather the elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. You see it? Mm -hmm. If Jesus is talking about the same sun, moon, and stars being darkened before he comes, he's talking about the same time that Joel's talking about. He's talking about the same time Paul's talking about. It all seems to be talking about one thing, not a couple different things. And look at the beginning of verse 29. Jesus says, you see why it's a problem for the other camps? Because look at the beginning of verse 29. It says immediately after the tribulation. Okay, so there's your problem. That, you have a problem reconciling that. And that was my problem. That's where the Holy Spirit led me to where I am. Because I had a problem reconciling all this to be total separate different things that I have to be like, well, this one happens on this event. This one happens on this event because it says this or this or this. It's like, no, if you just let the scriptures say what it says... It's all talking about the same thing. Well, it okay. separates, separates the tribulation from, you know, it separates it instead of it being one thing, which is kind of what I always thought. What do you mean now? We went through this the first time. 
Well, it just it makes it two I'm different things. Down. You know, because I remember I used to think that the tribulation, that seven years was all tribulation too. Like right. the seven years of tribulation. Right, so which we've know, talked about. Like, that's right a lot, right? That the seven years we do not call the tribulation because the Bible doesn't say seven years of tribulation. Right. Um, in Luke 13, it says the harvest is ripe. I just think, and that's right yes. before the stars go dark. So I just think it's interesting that he says the harvest, which obviously is is everyone. So in the right part is what the word that I'm sticking on, that right. So does that mean that we're ready? Right, that means that the time the is here. Are ready and right. that we're ready. Right. And more importantly, it means that the he's reaper right. is yeah, ready. He's right. <laughs> <laughs> if the time is but at the hand. the harvest is right. That's right, because he's the one giving the harvest, right? He's the one that gives the increase. He's the one doing it. So look, he knows exactly who all the elect are. And when the last elect is given elect. revelation yeah. <laughs> of the understanding of the gospel, then the time's up and it's time. Good. A uh, couple minutes. Yeah, questions, thoughts? We're going to look more at Day of the Lord stuff uh, for certain. And if you wrote down those other scriptures there, Isaiah and, and the others, um, look those up through the week for homework for sure. But, uh, but thoughts, questions, comments? we got like two minutes. That was neat how, you know, um, Joel 30 where you were reading, if you keep going, it says, and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls, calls upon, upon the name of the Lord, Lord shall be saved. Yeah. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. So, I don't know, I thought was your other... Right, go -to there's point. the other one. <laughs> yep, yeah. yep, yeah. that's why I had 32 in my brain, because that's the, anyone who calls upon the Lord. We know that, who calls upon the Lord? People that are saved. Believers, yep. Yeah. Those who are called, call upon the name of the Lord. Yep, unbelievers don't. Good. No more thoughts? You guys got it all down. Take out their notes. Take them home. Study. Questions. Yep. Write your questions down. Let's uh, let's discuss them. Uh, but still, again, we will continue to unpack the day of the Lord at least next week, and uh, and continue to see. But but see the building blocks, right? You just mm -hmm. keep building on the proper foundation. We keep building the walls of this structure that we're building, and uh, and they all need to fit, right? So if we get to a point where we feel like this this doesn't fit this structure, then we don't want to place it there. We don't want to, we don't want to do it. We want to be mindful of our teachings and what we believe. Um, so certainly if you've got questions and thoughts, let's talk about it. Duff's staring intently too. He likes, <laughs> he's the chart guy. Good? Okay. Would you pray for us then? Yeah. Thank you. Dear God, just uh, thank you again today for today. Um, to just be able to come here and learn more about your word and try to um, just kind of work through it and understand it more and more. Um, we just uh, pray for this next hour, um, for the preaching, that you would just do what you always do, God. Uh, you would uh, just open hearts, open minds, open ears, you know, mm -hmm. for us to just hear what you have to say to us today. And thank you for all of our gifts and blessings, God. Just thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just pray all this in his name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Yeah.